picks. I guess I'll get started now. So um, as uh, Ming Ming uh, said, my name is Kevin. Uh, my name is Kevin Henson. And um, I'm excited to be here to talk to talk to the group about um, cybersecurity. Um, part of my uh, daily responsibilities is to mentor uh, um, other uh, members of my team, other junior members of my team. So I like to share my knowledge and I like to um, teach what I, you know, the experience that I've had um, over the years. And it also helps me um, learn how to teach. And so I'm getting something out of it as well. I'm learning um, as, as well from the people that I mentor. Um, so naturally, I'm kind of like an intro, introverted person. So as much as that, so, so um, you no know, more that I can speak to people and help mentor people, I think the better, um, a better teacher I'll be, and um, the better learner I can be. And so that's just a lesson that you can learn in life is to you try to help someone, you eventually get a reward of helping yourself. Um, as well. So that comes along with working with the team. Uh, I work with, on a team of um, 12 to 13 people, and I'll introduce my team um, further along um, in the slides. Um, so the official, my official title is uh, Lead Malware Reverse Engineer, and I work on a team within IBM Security called uh, the X Force Threat Intelligence Malware Team. And I joined um, this team about four years ago. Um, before I worked for IBM, I worked for um, a company called uh, General Dynamics, which is a defense contractor. And then before that, I worked for Lockheed Martin, which is another defense contractor. So I have a long history of working for uh, the Department of Defense and the intelligence communities. And all of that experience along the, along the years has helped me on my job now. Um, so this is the agenda I want to talk about um, during this particular um, session. I'm going to discuss um, cybersecurity and the cybersecurity mission. And then um, within cybersecurity, there are specific domains. And so, so I'm going to talk about some of those domains and how those domains um, map to some of the trending cyber threats that we face um, today. I'm also gonna talk about careers and the skills you need for the cybersecurity um, industry. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my team. And um, during that part of the session, I'm gonna talk about reverse engineering and the different roles um, on my team. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the current threat landscape, um, like what are companies facing um, as threats like ransomware and uh, cyber criminals and all of that, um, all of that good, good stuff. And then it, I can end with the uh, question and answer session. So any questions you have, um, just let me know and I'll see if I can um, answer them. You can also, um, I think that's like a chat uh, with the Zoom, and maybe you can throw some questions in the chats as well. All right, sounds good. So yeah, so everyone, if you have questions, just you can type in the chat. Then Kevin will answer at the end. Thanks. All right. Um, hopefully, I don't miss any chat. Any um, chat questions? I don't see a chat actually on here. Sometimes it's hard to find the actual chat window. But if you have any questions, just um, uh, we'll figure it out as long um, as we go along. Yeah, um, I, I will so, monitor the chat window. <laughs> Don't okay, worry. yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. It's always good to have a partner during these uh, during these sessions. Um, so it's a little bit, a slide, I think it goes over a little bit about myself. Um, like I said, I've been with um, the uh, threat intelligence team for um, four years, um, and I've been reverse engineering for a very long time, uh, for over 12 years now. And, um, you know, like I said, I have experience you know, supporting the Department of Defense and the intelligence community projects. Um, I've also done some uh, digital forensics 
um, as well um, as part of my career. I have uh, two degrees. One, it's a bachelor's degree in information systems from Virginia State University. And then two years ago in 2020, um, I completed my master's degree in information systems engineering um, from John Hopkins University. So um, it, took me, it took me a while to get through my master's, um, but it was a very satisfying feeling to, to get through that program. And um, as you start your cybersecurity career, um, you know, hopefully you'll be uh, fortunate to join a company that will help you um, further your education, whether it be in a college curriculum or through like um, maybe conferences and, uh, and things of that nature to build your cybersecurity experience. So IBM has been very good at promoting um, continuous education and conferences and, and various programs to, to support um, career, career growth. So now we're going to talk about getting started to talk about more about um, cybersecurity. And so what is cybersecurity? It's, um, it's defined as the practice of um, protecting network systems, programs, and data from criminal and um, unauthorized access. And so when you think about cybersecurity and you start your career, um, the core mission stays the same. Um, so you're, you know, you're in high school now, the core mission still stays the same as far as cybersecurity is concerned. Um, all your experience you're building um, as you go along is to help you protect um, these networks from unauthorized um, access. And so, you know, when you go along and you think about cybersecurity, cybersecurity, um, you can use th this type of definition as kind of like a like a base, like a like a baseline to start from. So you know, no matter how deep you go into it, you can think, well, you know, we'll take a step back and say, what is my mission as a cybersecurity professional? And then you can step back to this type of definition. Um, I think it helps um, ground you and keep you focused on what you need to do, um, no matter what field you go into with, in regards to um, cybersecurity. And so I mentioned um, unauthorized access um, on the previous slide. And so I, I mentioned that because um, in the cybersecurity industry, you're going to hear a term called um, campaigns. And a campaign is just um, an organized um, effort by threat actors to gain um, un unauthorized access um, to an organizations' um, data. And so in order to track campaigns, um, we work as a team. So me as a reverse engineer, I work alongside other groups within IBM security. For example, um, my main collaboration is with um, what's called threat hunters and I also work with incident responders. And those are those are the um, that's the group that goes out and investigate the intrusion incidents. Like for example, if a company gets gets hacked, uh, the incident responders will go out and investigate the intrusion. During their investigation, they will find malware on the systems, um, and then they will contact my team to provide support in the form of reverse engineering malware analysis. And as part of my day job, um, I potentially provide support to the incident responders and to the threat team. And so, you know, teamwork is a very important thing when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, the threats are so vast, the amount of data you need to protect is so vast, and the threats are constantly changing. And no one person can, can track um, those campaign campaigns on their own. We all work as a team. And so as you go into your cybersecurity career, um, career you, you will um, come to find that teamwork is, is a very important thing and collaboration um, is a very important thing. 
And um, I think you already participate in programs like um, they capture the flags and other and all those types of security related items. And those programs require teamwork as well. So getting that experience is um, very important as you go into your cybersecurity career. So what I have here is a lot of data points. And this particular graphic is what we call a mind map. And a mind map is a way to help you um, visualize a lot of data points and help you um, organize those data points and, and see their relationships between different, different data points. Um, so in this case, um, Mr. Henry Yang created a mind map of cybersecurity domains. And I thought this was a good graphic to show because it, it shows how vast the field of cybersecurity is and how many domains there are besides just um, a particular domain. For instance, I normally support what's in the uh, red boxes. So my own domains, so I touch mainly um, security operations, security operations down there in the left. And in the middle, you see um, threat intelligence. And so those are the two domains that I normally interface with um, every day. But when you think about malware and the threats that it poses, mal malware and uh, kind of touches kind of like all of these domains. Because the malicious files, um, depending on the threat actor and how they're developed, can be used to um, attack networks. They can be used to attack um, different types of um, programs, different types of software. So um, malware and reverse engineering and reverse engineering um, touches a lot of these domains. And so obviously, I can't go over all of these, and I'm not an expert in all of these domains. But I think um, when I look at these domains and I think about the current um, trends and the cyber threats, I feel the domains do stand out to me. And I'm going to go over those um, next. So these are the three domains, I think, um, when you look at the trends and look at what's going on in the um, cybersecurity landscape, uh, I think critical infrastructure, uh, network security and cloud security um, are the domains that see a lot of uh, trending threats. And so I'm going to go over each of those domains um, right now. Um, so do I have any, any questions so on, on anything I've gone over so far or anything to clarify? Uh, so far, I have not seen questions in the chat. Okay, great. But I I got comments that the 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 landscape chart you gave on the previous uh, is very actually helpful on me because we are talking about cybersecurity everywhere. Right. Um, I just amazed that that being somebody can put a you know whole charts to show where they are and uh, I actually found that your square on the middle bottom that threat intelligence right and i'm very curious you know what is it um i can understand that you know there's a government side the cloud side and where this fitting so look right. yeah yeah my map so that's my map so lots of things if you do, <laughs> do the search you could find a mind map for for um uh lots of different um fields and terminology there's a reverse engineering mind map and yeah they're, they're a very good tool, a very good learning tool. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to talk about the uh, cybersecurity domains. So the first one I'm going to talk about is critical infrastructure. And so this domain includes what's referred to as operational technology. And uh, operational technology encompasses things like encompasses the technology that controls and monitors industrial equipment, access and events. And when you think about the equipment that, that belongs in this domain, critical infrastructure, that's the equipment that brings you lights like an electrical plants, 
that equipment brings like clean water to your home. Um, you can think about things like uh, oil and natural gas refineries, or, um, automobile um, manufacturing plants. All those things use um, operational technology. And this particular domain is a target for threat actors because it is so critical to it provides all the necessities of life, of, uh, of living. And so if you target one of these domains, the, um, the organizations, the, uh, the government, um, you can really, um, you can really put like a real, a real hold on them to respond to demands. And it can really cause a lot of havoc, a lot of trouble um, in people's lives if one, if one of these um, plants get affected by um, cyber criminal activity. And so actually going through a cyber security career, um, more, than likely, more than likely you will um, have to deal with deal with the threats to critical infrastructure. I don't think that's going going to go away. Um, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the future of um, cybersecurity, what you can look forward to as um, as the next generation going into this field. And critical infrastructure is always going to be a target um, based on its place within uh, society. Uh, one term that you're going to run across uh, um, in critical infrastructure is called industrial control systems. And industrial control, control system is uh, more specific terms for the equipment that uh, controls the operational technology that you will find in electrical plants and water treatment facilities. Um, here I have a news article about um, a company called Colonial Pipeline, and they were recently um, breached um, last year. And this breach caused a lot of havoc in um, the fuel supply chain um, because you know they're part of critical infrastructure and they provide fuel to the United States. So once that pipeline got disrupted, it caused a lot of havoc um, in different places. And this particular breach was caused by a compromised password. And you know, you think about password security, you may think, well, it's a no-brainer to protect the password, but it's not, sometimes it's not as simple as um, sometimes it is not like a simple thing to protect the password, even though it seems like simple, like a simple concept. And so if cybersecurity practices are not followed. If they're not implemented by companies, um, a lot of havoc and a lot of trouble can ensue after that. So here is a list of various um, malware that's been used um, over the years to attack um, critical infrastructure. So I encourage the group to do a little research and investigate operational technologies. Um, you will find that um, OT is an emerged as a top threat um, among cyber experts. And um, you know, we need skilled practitioners within practitioners within cybersecurity to be able to understand and uh, implement the security needs uh, of this domain. Because as you have you seen with the colonial pipeline and, and other um, activities in the news, um, this particular domain is it's kind of different than the rest because if you affect um, like an electrical plant or you affect the uh, water treatment facilities, um, it can really cause damage to families and, and lives. So that, that is a very important um, thing to understand as you go into um, cyber security. Um, but here I have a list of malware that's been used in uh, attacks over the years. Um, the first one is called Stuxnet. And this is a particularly um, advanced threat, and it was used to attack um, Iranian nuclear facilities. Um, and then and it specifically it was used to attack what's called uh, supervisory control and data acquisition systems or SCADA systems. Um, so I'm not going to allow the uh, technical details of ICS systems, 
because um, honestly, just as I feel that I'm, I'm trying to learn myself as a cybersecurity um, practitioner. So we don't we don't analyze a whole lot of um, ICS malware, but we do get some samples in, um, especially during uh, um, now that we have the Ukrainian conflict going on. Um, Havoc, Havoc is another um, malware that was used. Um, and this particular malware was used as mainly a reconnaissance tool. So it will scan the network and look for ICS devices um, connected um, to the network. Um, another sample I have is uh, Black Energy. Um, this particular malware was used to attack um, Ukrainian power grids. And the last one I have is called In Destroyer. And this one was used to attack um, um, power grids and it contained what's called a, a wiper component. And that wiper component is used to basically erase data from a systems. So once you erase data, um, it's very hard to recover um, if you don't have some type of recovery plan or a backup plan in place. And I have some sources down there um, where I drew this information from. Um, if you want to note those down and um, do a little research on your own um, to get a little bit deeper feel about um, the malware and the uh, critical infrastructure um, in general. Um, the next domain is network security. Um, so this domain includes um, protecting hardware, software, um, devices and data from threats, um, both on-premise, which means within the organization itself and within the cloud means mostly uh, uh, in, in a remote location. And so this domain focuses on securing our wireless and wired connections from intruders. And, um, and a lot of times in, on the network side, um, vulnerabilities may um, serve as an initial attack vector and uh, an initial attack vector is the initial foothold that a threat actor um, gains on on a, on a system. For example, one of the top um, initial attack factors is a phishing, an email. A simple email that's, look, that's um, crafted to look, look like a legitimate email from someone that you know, but instead of containing links to legitimate websites. It contains uh, links to uh, malicious websites or it, it contains email attachments uh, um, to uh, malware. And so uh, overall policy when it comes to network security is a layered defense policy, uh, one that protects the viruses within the network, meaning protects your own personal, your own um, computer and, and it also protects um, devices at the perimeter, like the network devices, like routers, switches, switches, and things of that nature. And so how do we go about protecting um, the networks? Um, so as a cybersecurity professional, um, you can help companies um, determine the assets that they have in stock and the patch level of the assets. So maintaining a patch level is a very important. And a patch is like a, a software update. For example, if you work on Windows and you get a notice saying Windows update uh, needs to, to run to download some security updates, um, those security updates are considered patches. And so if you don't patch your systems regularly, you could leave yourself open to um, to hackers and breaches um, if they find uh, vulnerable abilities on on your systems. And also, um, as a cybersecurity professional, helping companies know what devices are connected to the network. Um, with some companies are huge, um, and sometimes they may not know exactly what's plugged into their network. Um, so another, another example is 
um, we can help companies ensure that the assets like servers and network devices are configured properly. Um, in some cases, companies may um, install a device on a network, but instead of resetting the password, the default password might still be configured on the system. Um, the system may have open ports. So when the threat actors does like scanning of the networks, um, those open ports will be found and then um, the threat actors can attack systems through those, through those open ports. And then um, reinforcing a policy like two-factor authentication is also important. Two-factor authentication is, means that you have to get through two levels of security to get logged into the network. Um, for example, within the Colonial Pipeline, um, if you figured out the password, then you might need to get past another, another security feature to move, move forward within the network. So that means that two, two, there are two security mechanisms you have to um, get past in order to, to do something. Um, also within network security, we have um, the responsibility to protect our wireless connections. Um, and so wireless, connect, wireless network security just involves um, protecting uh, devices that are connected to a larger network over uh, wireless protocols. And so those devices include the wireless access points and routers. And so those routers and access points can be accessed by anybody um, within range of the, um, the wireless network. So if you don't have um, the proper protocols to protect that wireless connection, anyone can just log in and start um, doing things on your network. Um, you might notice if you look at your cell phone and you walk through the mall and walk through any store, you see wireless networks that pop up on your phone. Or if you're like in, in like a, a coffee shop and you open up your laptop, you'll automatically see like free Wi-Fi connectors available for you to connect to. All those things are, are potential threats to the network. And they are um, by definition, potential um, targets for attackers um, as well. Um, some wireless protocols that you may hear about or, or already know about um, include um, WPA or Wi-Fi protected access. And there are also uh, VPN requirements um, where you can log in through the VPN to provide a layer of protection um, to, to get you passed into the next level um, of the wireless um, network. Um, the next domain is cloud security. So cloud with um, cloud security, um, a lot of companies are moving to the cloud to keep their organization more streamlined and to um, help relieve themselves of some of the responsibility, some of the workload of managing uh, like servers and um, applications. Um, so when they move to the cloud, the cloud service providers provide help them manage those services, um, helps them manage the hardware and the uh, storage devices. But when you move to the cloud, when you move to the cloud, um, you also have to worry about very, very threats that come with that. And the cloud providers um, provide various levels of services uh, when you move to, move to the cloud. Um, with cloud security, you um, you may hear a few terms such as infrastructure as a service, uh, platform as a service, and uh, software as a service. And so these are just different levels of service that the, the um, cloud providers provide companies. Um, for example, for infrastructure as a service, the, uh, the company manages the data and software on, on premise, and the cloud provider manages the hardware, the networking, 
um, the virtualization, virtualization and the storage needs for platform as a service, um, the um, cloud provider manages the application development um, by providing a framework. Um, and this framework manages the operating system and manages updates, storages, and the supporting infrastructure for software as a service. Um, um, the cloud manages um, the software is hosted within the cloud itself. So when you log in to a system and you're using the uh, application, you actually use an application that's up in the, in the cloud. And some common cloud providers are IBM Cloud, uh, Amazon Web Services, and Microsoft um, Azure. Um, so the threats you, you, you need to think about when it comes to cloud security is um, who's going to be accessing the data. So when you when you put the uh, data within the cloud, you're relying on the cloud provider to provide some type of um, over, oversight as to who's going to access the data. And so as a company, you may not may not have a transparency, transparency as to who is actually accessing your data because there are so many um, players involved once you move to the cloud. Um, another concern is misconfigurations. Um, for example, you might have heard about the Amazon um, S3 buckets being exposed. Um, and that's because of a misconfiguration of those uh, data storage uh, data storage um, services. Um, another consideration is that when you move to the cloud, you have multiple um, uh, multiple organizations in the cloud next to you. So if one company is targeted, you may become um, collateral collateral damage of that a breach of that particular company. So, you know, when you have um, data, data hosted within your own environment on premise, you have more control of it over, over that data. You have more control over the security. Um, but when you go to the cloud, some of that security, um, some of that control over, this, of, over the security is um, given to the provider in exchange for more for less, um, I guess, responsibility of managing the servers and the hardware. So that's, a, that's kind of like a give and take of that. But the overall um, thing to be concerned with with cloud security is who's accessing the data, um, misconfiguration, and um, who your neighbors are within that cloud environment. Okay, so any questions um, up until this point? There's a question on the chat. Yeah, there's a question in the chat. Um, yeah, from Ethan asking, will moving to the cloud reduce malware? Yeah, I think there's a cloud, every, everyone moving to cloud. Um, so one was, will moving to the cloud reduce malware? Um, I don't think so. <clears throat> when you, um, there are um, malware samples that actually um, are cloud-based, like they attack cloud platforms. And you can actually like download malware from the cloud. I don't think it will actually reduce um, malware See, we're moving to the cloud. We just no. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think there. I don't, I don't think there would be a reduction in malware um, if you move to the cloud. Okay. So next, we'll talk about cybersecurity careers. So as, as you probably can imagine. The, the name of this talk is cybersecurity, a field of possibilities. Um, so the career options available for you within cybersecurity are, are immense. So there's, this is a good time to get into the field because there's so many opportunities 
there's so many opportunities um, to learn. For example, you know, YouTube videos, um, online content, blogs you can learn from. Um, you can learn about any number of cybersecurity related um, fields. So when I started, I started in 2010, and you didn't have a whole lot of this, a whole lot of the uh, the learning opportunities that you have now. So I encourage everyone to take advantage of looking at YouTube videos, looking at uh, reading the blogs, and um, just reaching out to um, to people that you know and the people that you trust um, to learn about um, cyber security. So I found this um, nice graphic on the uh, CISA website, and I thought it gave a good overview um, in one spot of all the career options that are available um, when considering uh, cybersecurity. And so, for example, if you're interested in obfuscation, uh, obfuscation is just another way of saying um, hiding data. Um, so when you look at malware, malware tends to, the developers of malware um, tend to try to obfuscate or hide what the malware is doing. Um, so if you're interested in that, you might want to focus on um, cryptography. Um, if you're interested in helping organizations investigate and recover from uh, incidents or intrusions, you might want to consider uh, incident responder or a for being a forensic expert. Um, if you like breaking into systems or testing the system systems uh, to find vulnerabilities, then a pen tester or a vulnerability uh, analyst may be something of interest. And then if you like developing programs like uh, writing software, then a software developer uh, maybe your area to focus on. So there's in, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of opportunity, and if you notice that not all all of these opportunities are necessarily technical opportunities. Like a cyber legal advisor, it's not like a a really deep technical field to be in, but it's available for people to pursue. Um, a language analyst, it's not a a very technical field, but it's something for folks to pursue. So I work with I've worked alongside former lawyers, former teachers. So the cyber security field has drawn in people from different different fields, different walks of life. See, I saw another question here. And I saw another question. Okay, yeah, that's so the one pop up. Yeah, I just uh, paste the URL to the oh, okay, yeah, okay. still right. site. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, when I found this, um, I said, oh, "This is just wonderful to look at." And if you go to the um, to the site and you cl click on one of the uh, the keys there, it, it gives you it gives you more detail about the particular position, um, um, for example, whether it requires a degree, um, the salary involved, and all, all of those details. So with um, cybersecurity careers, you don't necessarily need a four-year degree, um, even though I have one, but you don't necessarily need it um, to get started within uh, within the field, um, and I don't think you necessarily need it to get hired by a company. Um, what a lot of companies look for is hands-on experience. And, you know, coming out of high school, obviously you won't have a whole lot of hands-on experience, but what you will have is experience um, as a cyber defender. So participating in programs like this helps build your resume um, helps gives you um, experience that another student may not have. So I think programs like Cyber Defender and the Cyber Patriots are very important because they teach you 
um, how to gain experience in cybersecurity. They teach you, teach you how to gain experience with the um, STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and math. And they help you build what's called soft skills. And um, soft skills are considered like teamwork skills or communication skills. And those skills are very important. Um, you may, some people may say those are just as important as the actual practical technical skills. Um, from my experience, I think um, teamwork skills is very important because I can't, as a reverse engineer, I may not know everything about a particular piece of malware, but odds are, odds are one of my team, one of my team members may know. And so as a good team member, um, my responsibility is to communicate with my team you know, and ask them questions. So as you go into your cybersecurity career, um, always remember to lean on, lean on your team. Also remember that um, you may not know everything, but um, as a collective, as a team, you can get a lot, a lot of work done. So I find that to be very important um, as I've gone uh, through my uh, cyber, cyber, cyber secu security career. All right, so now we're gonna um, do a little pivot into actually looking at uh, reverse engineering and taking a look at the process, um, um, some of the, the tools that I use and the makeup of the team that I am a part of. So my team is called uh, the X-Force, IBM Security X-Force Threat Intelligence Malware Team. And so our team is made up of um, a unique combination of skills. Um, we consist of uh, reverse engineers, and we also consist of what's called intelligence developers. And the, the REs, or reverse engineers, and the developers, um, we collaborate. So we, we um, communicate with the developers the type of tools that we need to help us automate the analysis of the malware. And uh, some of the critical skills that we use on our team are computer science, computer engineering, and software engineering. Um, the developers are very helpful because um, their know-how in software development helps translate our uh, requirements to, to analyze the malware into something, something that's scalable. Um, there's thousands of malware samples out there to look at. And as a human, you can't possibly look at all those malware samples one at a time. So a big thing on our team is to automate as much as we can. So we want to, we want to work smarter, not harder. So for example, if I get a sample in, a malware sample, I'll analyze it. <clears throat> I'll um, understand how it works. Then I'll communicate that to the developer and they can, can, they can develop a tool uh, based on my requirement to help break apart that malware sample and report back to me all those um, attributes that I, that I figured out how to do manually. So automation and software development is a, uh, is a very important skill to have when it comes to cybersecurity um, engineering. It can save you a lot of time and get the results back to, for example, the incident responders um, who help the organizations uh, figure out uh, what's been taken from their systems, what malware is on the system. So all, all the uh, teamwork between the reverse engineers and developers are important. So when you think about reverse engineering, um, I define it as uh, breaking apart a target object to determine how it operates and to extract information or what's called indicators of compromise. 
those indicators is what um, the incident responders and the threat hunters use to further their investigations to find out um, what type of malware it is, um, what the threat actor group identification is. Um, so as a reverse engineer, your ultimate goal is to extract as much information you can, as thoroughly as you can, and as quickly as you can. And so one of the, um, um, as, a, as a reverse engineer, you, you can, you can uh, end up analyzing any file type. Um, so I analyze executables or programs. I could analyze a PowerShell script or I could analyze a Microsoft Word document or an um, Excel document. And as we're going through the process, one, one of the, some of the things we want to look for is how does the malware operate? Does it steal data? Um, will, it leave, will it leave traces of, of its operations um, on the system? Um, where does it communicate? Where is the command and control server um, located? Um, are there any other unique attributes that can help us identify the family of malware? Um, are there any attributes that can, that can help us identify what the threat actor or cyber, cyber criminal group actually uh, deployed and developed um, a particular malware? And so if you want to get started with reverse engineering, um, you know, I think a commonality is curiosity because you're always gonna um, learn something new um, and you're always gonna have like a feeling of, I have this thing and I wanna break it apart to see how, how it works. And um, for me, it was the curiosity that got me started um, with re um, reverse engineering. And so when I first started this career path, in reverse engineering, I was um, supporting a uh, intelligence, um, a government intelligence um, entity. And I started reading in the news and hearing about malware and uh, forensic investigations. And I found that to be interesting. And then I learned about the process of how reverse engineering takes place. And I was like, well, that's right up my alley because I like to investigate things, I like to break them apart, it, to see how they work internally. And I've been doing it for um, over 12, 12 years now. And a very um, easy way to um, you know, get started with, with reverse engineering is to just read online resources. Um, like I said before, Google is like, Google is your friend, as they say. So you can you know, do some searches on uh, resources that you can look at, uh, video tutorials. Um, um, you can find samples to practice with, but you have to be careful when you're actually practicing with malware because you can really um, uh, infect your system. You can infect your <laughs> infect your network really if you're not careful with it. And I'm um, always remember to um, to ask questions. That's very important in cybersecurity. Um, so the process that, um, that that we go through when we reverse engineer malware, um, we basically can reverse engineer uh, many file types. Uh, um, there's two basic types of analysis. One is called dynamic analysis, and one is called um, static analysis. Um, static analysis is the hardest and most time consuming. And um, dynamic analysis is um, the easiest because you can just um, execute the malware within a safe environment called a sandbox. And then you can observe execution of the malware within the sandbox. And then you can re report, back, report back on the results. Um, um, static analysis is harder 
Um, we can use we use various tools to do static analysis, and I have like a a grid of tools down there. Um, I'm not going to try to explain all of them, but suffice it to say, um, to say um, as a reverse as a reverse engineer, you use a variety of tools, and I think of reverse engineering um, as an art, meaning that each reverse engineer does it in a different way to achieve the same goal. So you might use a different set of tools um, to achieve um, the same goal. Um, so what's the biggest problem you faced so far, cybersecurity wise? That's the question. Um, I think the biggest problem from a uh, um, reverse engineer perspective is um, the number of samples you have to look at and the type of obfuscation that they use. Um, as time has gone, um, I've noticed that the malware has got, gotten um, a little bit more complex as far as um, obfuscation levels, as far as cryptography levels. Um, for example, um, I was looking at a sample the other day, and you look at the sample and you see that you really can't make sense of it because it's obfuscated. So I use one of these tools on a list, and I look at, for example, I use a tool called IDA, and it's called IDA, and it's um, the fourth one down on the list on the left. And with Ida, you can you can you can look at the malware and look at what's called functions within the malware. Um, and those functions are so obfuscated that I can't really make sense of it. So you have to work out ways to get around that obfuscation. And once you get around one level of obfuscation, then there's another one that the author has implemented. So you have to get around that level. And so that's one of the biggest challenges of dealing with malware is that the authors have gotten smart and they implement all these level, levels of obfuscation, not because it's more efficient, but because it slows the analysis down. And, um, and that's where automation comes in handy. Once you take the time to get past all of those levels of um, obfuscation, obfuscation you automate that process so that when that malware comes back again, you, you, you can just let the auto, you, you can just let the process take over automatically and it saves you uh, a tremendous um, amount of time. Um, yeah, so some of the tools that I use, um, um, they are used to extract strains from samples. They are used to analyze the structure of files. And they are used to um, analyze how um, the file operates. And um, always remember to execute your samples within uh, a safe environment. You don't want to execute your samples on your personal systems or your um, on a system that's, that's not protected or isolated. Um, these are some of the common malware types at a high level, um, spyware, ransomware, and the Trojans. Um, spyware is used to just monitor the victim's activity. It's used to steal data, um, like credit card information, account logins, um, the ransomware, um, I'm sure you've heard of um, the ransomware in the news. Um, they use, the ra ransomware used to encrypt systems and then they, they kind of extort money from the victims saying that if you don't pay this ransom, you won't get the key to unlock your files. Um, and then Trojans um, allow a threat actor uh, backdoor access to the systems. So, so Trojans can be implemented in many different ways and uh, installed uh, in many different ways 
um, on assist. Um, here are some uh, detailed details on specific malware categories. Um, so part of my job is to analyze any number of these categories. Um, I'm not gonna read through the entire list, um, <clears throat> but notably some, there is some overlap within the particular categories. Once you start to learn about malware and reverse engineering, you will find out that uh, um, a Trojan can be a downloader, a Trojan can be a worm. So there's a lot of overlap within the functionality of um, these samples. So I, again, I encourage group, the group to do some, do a little research and then learn about the different, different malware categories. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. I don't know if the guys are on LinkedIn or any platform like that, but, um, or you can reach out to me through, through Maine and I'll be happy to answer any questions um, you might have. Python is a programming language. It's a scripting programming language. And I use it to write scripts, what's called parsers, to um, extract the information. And these parsers go hand-in-hand um, -hand with um, automating, uh, which I've mentioned earlier. Um, so the idea is to be more efficient and work smarter and not harder. And so we analyze the code once, we develop a parser, and then we uh, integrate the parser into a larger system, into a larger um, automated system. So I, I, I like developing the parsers and I like analyzing the malware. So I've got the best of both worlds. So the worlds have been kind of like a developer and a reverse engineer um, at the same time. Another um, aspect to automating malware is that we can use a tool called Yara. Um, you may have heard of Yara, but basically it's a tool to help um, the malware researchers to identify and categorize the malware. And so um, this here looks kind of, kind of complex, but basically all you do is you take some internal attributes of the malware, you place it within um, this file, and then you apply conditions to those attributes. And if um, a certain number of those conditions match, then um, you can identify a particular malware family. Uh, for example, in this sample, the rule name is called Silent Banker. And this particular yard rule is supposed to detect um, a malware called Silent Banker. So if you have some type of uh, system where the rules are deployed and you can run your, your sample through that system, this yard rule will help you identify um, the sample. And the good thing about this is that you can um, process many samples. Again, it's good to have also have some type of development development pro, um, background or programming background because again that comes in handy when you're dealing with um, um, a high volume of data. Um, another um, cool aspect of my job is that we write blogs based on current events in uh, a malware that's in the news. Um, so this is just a list of some of the blogs that our my team has written um, this year. So we've written um, blogs on destructive malware. Um, a lot of malware has been used against Ukraine. So we write, we've written blogs about about that. Um, I wrote the um, template-based meta programming on um, blog, which is 
this is a it's a, it's, it's a complex thing, but um, uh, so meta programming is it's, it's like a, a programming technique to hide or obfuscate um, attributes of a malware. So I, I analyzed a sample that implemented meta programming, and I just I wrote a blog about it, and it was published on securityintelligence.com. So that's another a cool feature about um, um, my team and, and what we do. So do we have any other questions um, so far about uh, reverse engineering or um, the team that I work on? Uh, I don't see anything in the chat, but I do have a question. So. Uh, it looks the IBM X Force security team uh, not only does the analysis for the intrusion inside IBM, but also for any malware in the wild. That's... Yeah, so we we have a malware to get to get some um, basically when the systems get infected. Um, the uh, IBM has an incident response service that goes out and help the client help the clients during um, intrusion events. And so um, those intrusion events can happen in any country, in many countries, in many countries. And so, um, as a result, we analyze malware from different places, all different types of all different types of malware. And the one thing I forgot to mention is that our team is is a, a um, is a, a multinational team. We have team members in the Philippines. Um, we have team members in the UK, and we have team members in um, the United States. Um, on the East Coast, um, in Texas, and on the West Coast. So our team is a, a multinational team, and uh, we work well together, uh, given how spread out we are. So after um, reverse engineer finding all the malwares, um, do you guys responsible for recovery, repair? You know? um, the incident response team handles um, a lot of that. They give like recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, and they write reports on their findings. And uh, we write, we write uh, malware reports that we give to the incident responders. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think that's a new question in the chat asking how many members are there in your team? Um, we have about 13 members. So our team uh, is comprised of, like I said, the reverse engineers, the developers. We also have what's called a DevOps or uh, infrastructure team to help uh, manage our internal repositories of um, YAR rules and uh, malware samples. And we have a, a lab that we're trying to set up and the lab is for storing malware. The lab is for storing virtual machines and, and to help us just help us um, automate our malware analysis um, efforts. All right, so I think um, the last section is current threats. So now I'm going to go over some of the current threats that we see. Um, at the moment. So, um, so OT is a, a big, uh, a big target, like I said before, with the critical infrastructure. And some of the threats to OT is that the attackers are performing um, vulnerability scanning and brute force attacks. And another um, threat is that um, the employees are uh, being exported via phishing emails. Uh, phishing 
is a, has always been a top initial vector because it's just easy to send out spam to multiple um, victims, multiple companies. Um, manufacturing, um, electric utilities, and the oil and gas in industries are major targets. Um, uh, configuration errors are a big thing because they can lead to um, internet facing ports and services being open. Uh, and attacks on OT can be accomplished via IT networks. Um, for example, I think traditionally the OT environments like the um, electrical plants and the nuclear facilities are or um, like isolated, but since things are becoming more integrated, um, you have a pathway to get to the OT. So once you infect the IT system, like a server, and if that server is connected to um, a device within a critical infrastructure, then the attackers have a pathway to get from IT to that OT device. So it's kind of like the saying, you're only as strong as your, you are as strong as the weakest link within the chain. So if the weakest link is the IT systems, then that kind of like breaks the, the strength of that, of that in, um, integration. Um, another um, threat is ransomware. Um, so ransomware is very profitable, and I think it's going to, going to continue to be a top threat because the threat, the threat, the threat, the threat actors can make a lot of money from doing it. And they, like I said before, they implement what's called double extortion, where the threat actors will infiltrate the system, steal the data, then they'll encrypt the data and say, well, you know, if you don't, pay us, we're going to, we're going to not only leave your data encrypted, we're going to threaten to release your information to the public if the ransom is not paid. So they're extorting the victim in two different ways. They're keeping the data encrypted and they're um, threatening to release information to the public if they don't pay the ransom. Um, another um, threat when it comes to ransomware is that there are many um, initial vectors. Um, RDP is one, one initial vector. Our RDP stands for Remote Desktop Protocol. And because of the increased um, remote work, uh, workforce, given the pandemic, and people are working remotely and working from home, um, RDP has been implemented in a lot of companies to allow the workers to log into the systems. And in some cases, they configure, when they configure the RDP, they, um, they, they misconfigure it. So they leave ports open. And um, this has led to increased attack service with, uh, when it comes to RDP. Um, another threat when it comes to ransomware, again, is phishing. Um, you know, we get all these spams sent to us and they have links to fake websites and they have links to download malware and that malware infection can lead to um, a ransomware attack. Um, another threat is the, um, another threat is the, um, like, again, misconfiguration. Um, with a lot of these things, you see like a common, a common theme and, and a common threat that goes across multiple domains. And a lot of these things are like, you may think that it's a simple thing to double check your configuration, protect your password, but the reality is that it doesn't happen. And, and that's where um, cybersecurity professionals come into play to help the organizations um, get a handle on a lot of, the, a lot of these things. <clears throat> So this is just um, a workflow of a particular ransomware um, infection. Uh, normally it starts with the, um, a phishing um, and then they, they get access to the system via um, RDP or a compromised website. 
Then they steal the data. Um, next, they deploy the ransomware. And then once you deploy and execute the rans ransomware, um, the ransomware normally does a few things. Um, some of the um, things that it does when you execute it, it kills processes, it deletes backups, um, it terminates uh, like um, services, and it starts to what's called queuing the files up for encryption. And the reason that it does, it deletes the backups and the kills processes is because some of the systems have like antivirus installed. And so it kills all the antivirus processes. It deletes all the backups so you can't recover and it terminates any security services. So anything that deal, that inter, inter, interrupts the malware from executing, it tries to terminate all those um, security methods. Uh, and the last part, obviously, is encrypting, is encrypting the files. Um, um, uh, ransomware normally uses what's called symmetric file encryption, which means there's a public and there's a, a private key. And without the private key, you can't decrypt your files. Um, so here's some list of some um, mal, uh, ransomware that you may uh, run across, um, or evil, uh, sold in Kiwi. Then you got Riot, Conti, Lockpick, Lockbit, Black Matter, um, Darkside, and there's that other, there are a lot of different ransomware samples. And they all uh, have the ultimate goal of extorting money um, from the victim. Um, so this, I put this in here just to show you um, some of the features of Solar and Kiwi and to show you what one of the tools that I use um, look like. And so um, Solar and Kiwi has, it uses um, what's called RC4 encryption. Um, and you can use it uh, to um, target specific files to encrypt. Um, it has um, a, it exports a vulnerability and it, it can be used to wipe a specific folder called backup, which is on the system. And it communicates outside, outside of the network to a C2 um, command and control server. And what you see here is a, it's a tool called um, um, it's a tool used to um, parse the binary. And as a reverse engineer, we use tools um, like this um, every day. And, and what it does, it gives you, uh, it breaks down the malware into specific sections. And each of these sections contain um, um, a specific type of data. And as a reverse engineer, um, you know, you know, you get used to looking at uh, all of these numbers and and all of this. And this does mean something to me. It may not mean something to you, but it means something to me. Um, and so, as a reverse engineer, you'll learn how to use these type of tools, and um, you'll learn how to use uh, many types of tools. Um, another current threat is uh, Linux malware. Um, and so Linux malware is on the rise because of um, IoT devices are normally um, a target of Linux, mal Linux malware. Um, and because a lot of companies are moving to the cloud and the cloud services are Linux based. Um, with the um, IoT, there, there are billions of IoT devices, devices, um, especially um, used everywhere, and so that's a that's a huge um, attack surface. And these IoT devices are things like refrigerators, um, routers, um, home alarm systems. Now, all of these things have like uh, uh, the Linux operating system on them, 
And so the, the developers, they um, create these, these malware and they launch the, uh, the attacks against the IoT devices. And these attacks basically turn the device into what's called a zombie. And a zombie is used to form, to form what's called botnets. And these botnets are used to launch what's called a denial of service attack. And a denial of service attack is basically, basically sending a lot of information to a host. Um, and it sends so much information that it slows down the host. So it denies the host, it denies the user of the host the services. And so that's where the name came from, uh, denial of service attack. And some, some notable malware that's involved with botnets is called XOR DDoS, um, Mirai, and uh, another one called Mosey. Um, how am I doing with time? Um, yeah, that's six twenty-seven. So we're very close to the time. I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm almost done. So, um, so another uh, um, current threat is phishing attacks. Um, and I've mentioned phishing attacks before. Um, it's it's the uh, number one initial uh, vector, and the ultimate goal of a phishing attack is to either steal credentials, gain access to a network um, or deploy ransomware. And the uh, threat actors, um, they spend a lot of time making the emails look legit. So to deceive the user into actually clicking on the links or downloading the attachments. Um, another, um, yeah, so this is still, uh, Phishing attacks. There are several different types of phishing attacks. Um, for for instance, there's a spear phishing attack, which is a targeted attack against a a specific uh, individual. Um, there's a Microsoft 365 phishing attacks, which is an effort to gain access to uh, Microsoft 365 email accounts. Um, there's what's called business email compromise attacks and those um, are uh, emails sent uh, mostly to like executives or high ranking employee high ranking um, employees um, that that's also called uh, voice phishing or vishing attacks and those are social engineering attacks um, via phone calls and basically the attacker pretends to be for example, uh, help desk representatives um, in order to deceive you into giving them confidential information. Um, another one again is the IoT attacks. And so since, since IoT um, involves billions of devices, it has a, a huge attack surface again. And, um, Devices with IoT devices include things like uh, the, the ring doorbell, um, your home thermostat, um, or um, devices like a Fitbit or some type of um, exercise monitoring device. Some um, common IoT vulnerabilities is the weak passwords because um, the nature of IoT devices is that sometimes people um, don't necessarily pay close attention to, the, to, to um, securing them. So they leave default passwords behind. Um, sometimes the developers of the device um, leave hidden back doors so they can uh, um, get into the device to do administrative work. Um, some of the devices have unencrypted traffic because, because this, when you think about IoT, um, sometimes security wasn't the first thought when you like design like a, a Fitbit device. So when that Fitbit device sends information, uh, some of that information may be unencrypted. 
Um, again, uh, those those devices have a low patching level because it, it may be difficult to patch. Um, say, for example, a home alarm system. Um, and again, uh, misconfiguration, even default passwords within the, uh, these devices. Some notable IoT malware, again, I've already gone over these, uh, Mirai, Mozi, um, and XOR DDoS. So now let's take a look at the, uh, the future, at least what I think is, is gonna happen in the future. Um, so I think uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning will um, be more of a more of a um, more of a help to identify threats because of the volume of data, the volume of threats. Um, you know, it will take a lot for a human to sift through all of this information. So um, I think machine learning will be used to learn the threat patterns and then help identify those threats. Um, I think ILT will continue to grow. Um, we, will, we will get more devices online, uh, more devices will become internet accessible. And so ILT, ILT will continue to grow. The ransomware threat will continue to grow because I think it, it will continue to be a profitable um, enterprise. So as long as the bad guys can make money on it, they're going to continue to do it. Um, OT will continue. Um, the OT threat, um, attacks on OT will continue because those OT, de OT devices, the critical infrastructure will become more integrated and more accessible um, uh, via the internet for convenience. And I think the demand for cyber skills will continue to increase because of all of those things I mentioned before. Um, we live in a more digital world, a more technical advanced world. And so you're gonna need people to, who, who understand um, that, te that technology. Um, we're gonna need people to design it, to program it, to maintain it, and to, um, to defend it. And so all that takes, um, you know, a broad array of skills and the, the demand for those skills will continue to increase. So I'm at the end. So um, do we have any other, you know, the questions? Uh, let me see. Uh... I don't see any new question in the chat. Uh, anyone has any other question? So, uh, Kevin, I want to ask you. So, uh, so when you're working, yeah, I know you work for this reverse engineering and uh, dealing with incident response. How's your workload? Do you have to work a lot of time, like overtime, after hours? Uh, um. Do Work no, I don't have to. Um, no, I'm not required to work overtime. Um, sometimes you do get requests because uh, we support um, customers around the world, so that maybe you know in a different time zone. Um, and sometimes I do um, be what's called on call. Uh, so we we'll, we do that like on our um, like a monthly rotation or month and a half rotation. So it's not too bad to be on call. And that basically means that um, if something comes in on the weekend, because cybercrime happens right. 24 seven. So if something comes in on the weekend, um, the manager will call you to take a look at, take a look at a particular sample or something like, some, something of that nature. Okay. But uh, as far as working overtime, we really don't do a whole lot of overtime homework. We're not required to do it. Um, but, you know, working remotely comes with, um, you have to be cognizant of the work-life balance because you're always at home and you're always available. I have Slack on my cell phone. 
So, you know, you have to kind of like balance everything. So I have a question about the artificial intelligence relationship with the cybersecurity. So you, you mentioned that, that the AI is used to help to automate the process to identify the malwares, you know, or do that. Is any, do you see any of trend of the AI used to create those kind of malwares or, you know, finding those, you know, hidden spots or how could it, you know, do that? To use AI to you say create the malware? Yeah, or use the AI to find the, the holes, the security holes, do you? Uh, um, I don't, I, I haven't seen it, but as with everything, you know, we create something for good, the bad guys are gonna repurpose it to do their mm -hmm. bidding as well. So, you know, I think that is that that is a possibility for the bad guys to to utilize machine learning and, and artificial intelligence for their own profit. Wow. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I know it's pretty late for you, Kevin. So it's uh, you're. It's nine, like a nine, almost nine forty your time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I think yeah, yeah. It's a very informative session and uh, bring us the industry perspective. Yeah, real perspective from you know professional working pers yeah experience. So I think students really yeah they want to hear from the real industry professionals. Yeah. So. Thank you very much for taking time to uh, come here and give us this great session. Yeah, thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you, Ming, for uh, um, being able to me to uh, participate. Yeah, and yeah. also thank you, Mimi, for, yeah, make this happen, organizing, connect, connect, connecting with Kevin. Yeah, I think if anyone in the session has any question, yeah, you can relate to Mimi, then Mimi can, you know, uh, connect with Kevin. Absolutely, absolutely. I put in a second uh, intent that uh, appreciate all the students coming here. Um, also, off school, um, listen to this talk. Um, Kevin has put her, 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 his heart to share his industry experience with us. Um, Kevin, you are pretty much the first speaker series to talk about. Oh, wow. okay. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully, I did a, a pretty decent job. So yeah. oh, you did a, you did a fantastic job. Uh, yeah, you put a very high bar for us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I learned a lot, I personally. So all right. Thank you. If you need me to come back to do um, additional talks or do deeper talks into. A, reverse engineering um, and give some examples or, or run some demo or demonstrate some tools. Um, I, I can do that um, as well. <clears throat> great, great. We will look forward to that. All right, Kevin, thank you. All, All right, right, thank you. Good night. All right. Okay. Thank you. calling